thanks everyone, thank you. Thanks for coming out, thanks Jennifer. Uh, as I was getting ready to come out, I turned to Mimi and I said, break a leg. And she said, that's not funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming out. This is a live taping of the Sporkful podcast. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, we're really just gonna jump right into it. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, this is the Sporkful, blah, blah, blah. We're coming to you from the Jerome Green Performance Space in New York City, and that's what I'm gonna give you your cue. And that's gonna be your chance to make a lot of noise, to get very excited. Okay, and then I'm gonna introduce Mimi and then you have to get even more excited, okay? And uh, your phones are off, we're recording, right? Cool, yep, always make sure you're recording. And a uh, <laughs> little audio tip for you. Um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun, so get ready, here we go, all right. This is The Sporkful. It's not for foodies, it's for eaters. I'm Dan Pashman. Each week on our show, we obsess about food to learn more about people. And we're coming to you from the Jerome L. Green Performance Space in New York City. Thank you so much for coming out to this special edition of The Sporkful. And it's special because I have a special co-host riding alongside me for this episode. She is a legendary food writer and restaurant critic. She is known for her wit and for her strong opinions. I once asked her, I said, Mimi, you know, where did you, when did you come to have the courage of your convictions? And she said, as soon as they put a pen in my hand. <laughs> Please welcome the one and only Mimi Sheridan. as you can see, and it's just wonderful to have everybody come out on such a busy week with so many things for everybody to do. So I hope we all have fun. I think we will. I think we will. I, um, I recently, Mimi, was uh, enjoying one of your favorite desserts. I know you're a fan of affogato. I am indeed. I have it quite often. It's the uh, shot of espresso on it top of vanilla. It means suffocated, and what suffocated is a ball of vanilla ice cream in a pour over a very hot black espresso. And so the ice cream kind of melts down as you go along and you eat various stages of ice cream and coffee. And it's usually dessert and coffee in one and it's cheaper than getting dessert and coffee. Oh, there you go. That, that's a good tip. <laughs> Beside being lovely. <laughs> so. How do you think that affogato should be served? Should, the, should it be served with the espresso on the side or should yes. it be served oh, already poured together? You, usually they serve the espresso in a little pitcher or in an espresso cup, and the ice cream is in a small glass, a small, narrow, short glass. Well, that sounds kind of like a drinking vessel. It is. You drink it at the end. As the ice cream melts, you eat some of it as ice cream, and then finally you're left with a lovely mixture of coffee that has this thick, cream melted into it, mm. and you pick it up and drink it. It is indeed a drinking thing at the end. Because you and I, as you may recall, we, we had a lovely dinner together a little while back, and we had affogato for dessert, but we had a little bit of a difference of opinion, because I feel like affogato should be eaten with a spoon. You should eat it before it turns into a, a beverage. You do. You eat the ice cream part of the way down. You sip and you eat and you sip and you eat, and then in the end you drink. So it's three separate experiences. <laughs> Cafe Clooney for $7.50. So you end up with your coffee. But you wouldn't rather just get it. I don't like to sip. I just want a spoonful of like half vanilla ice cream and half espresso in my spoon. You can do that at a certain point. But you get you got to finish it all as a dessert before it gets to the drinking part. Before it gets to the drinking part, but before it's only drinking... It's eating and drinking. We'll go and have, we'll have a demonstration. <laughs> I'll show you <laughs> the proper way to eat an affogato. What do you think about the idea of affogato with different flavors of ice cream? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why oh, not? No. 
It's just the vanilla is so good with the coffee. I can't think of any other flavor. Or a chocolate? chocolate would give you sort of mocha. Coffee would give you coffee. But the right contrast, because you put cream in coffee, therefore you eat vanilla ice cream with it. I mean, you can do what you want, but <laughs> you may not be right. I noticed, that you, <laughs> I noticed that you said you eat vanilla ice cream with it. You didn't say you drink. Eat. You don't drink ice cream. You eat ice cream. <laughs> all right, all right. Fair enough. At least I do. I don't know about you. <laughs> so, Mimi, I have lately been reading and enjoying your memoir. And, you know, it's interesting. We've been doing this show, these Ask Mimi shows for a while now. We get a lot of relationship questions. A lot of people want advice on relationships from you, and you've given a lot of great advice, but you haven't had the opportunity so much to give advice on romance, the stuff that happens before the relationship. Well, I guess that's Dr. Ruth's territory, and it sort of depends on the questions we're asked. So the questions you pick uh, haven't allowed for romance, but right. maybe because they think food, they don't bother us with romance. They save it to Dr. Ruth. But your seminal, or I should at least say, say but your first b book, The Seducer's Cookbook. But they don't know that. Well, let, well tell folks about it. <laughs> well, it was a book of uh, menus and recipes for certain situations of seduction, uh, mostly for men to seduce women. And the book was out for a couple of years when Helen Gurley Brown took over as the editor of Cosmopolitan. And, and I, I'm sorry, but I wish for younger listeners, Helen Gurley Brown, not only the, editor, the, the seminal editor of Cosmopolitan, here, what's that? Anyone here so young that they don't know who Helen Gurley Brown was? Really? We have several hands, yes, yes. Well, Helen she, Gurley Brown not only was really the, the woman who created Cosmopolitan as we know, but she wrote a seminal work called Sex and the Single Girl, which was like a... Uh, uh, a seminal saying, work of the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. Yeah, she said it's okay to do it. That's what she told <laughs> girl. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. That was a typically concise summary of <laughs> Helen Gurley Brown's life's work. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we don't have all the time in the world, so let's get it said. And, um, and then she took over Cosmopolitan many years later and followed with that theme. And when she got to her office, she found a copy of my book, and she said, I want to serialize it, but I want to turn it around so it's women seducing men. And I said, why do you want to do that? She says, because women buy books and men don't, so <laughs> we would change it around a little bit. But there was also something revolutionary about the idea of writing about women seducing men. Yes, but I, I felt it really didn't take much for a woman to seduce a man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, all you really just had to be there with a more or less horizontal surface. And as we see now, there are men seducing women like mad all over the place. There must be no more employees left at CBS by the end of today. And if you're caught sexually harassing a woman, at CBS, you get $120 million to go away. So that's what Mr. Moonves is getting right. to go away. Right. So. Um, tell us about some of the tips that were in the Seducer's Cookbook. Oh, well, it was, uh, it's hard for me to remember offhand, but that had to do with the way the room was done and uh, why the food was right for the situation. Some of the situations were your best friend's husband, or your best friend's wife, or... What's the secret uh, of that one? <laughs> not that I'm, I mean, I'm asking for a friend. I I'm don't just... remember the menu. I should have brought the book. <laughs> <laughs> and you also uh, have a career, which you talk about in your memoir, uh, early in your career as a writer, you, you wrote for a magazine called Eros? Yes, Eros and Avant Garde. They were both very beautiful, artistically designed magazines by a famous art director, Herb Lou Ballin. The editor was Ralph Ginsberg, who was rather a notorious character in publishing. And uh, I had several articles in each. I had one in Eros and a couple in Avant-Garde. What were some of the topics you wrote about? Uh, the one, I don't remember if it was Eros or Avant-Garde, but it was my search for French ticklers in Japan. 
And, and, and for the listeners who don't know, uh, didn't know who Helen Gurley Brown was, uh, what are French ticklers? <laughs> is there anyone here who doesn't know what a French tickler is? Is the same you age? are oh, even more people. You don't know anything. Where did you, <laughs> where did you grow up? <laughs> He's been to well, Japan they're not times. Japanese, though they made them there. It's a condom with little flowery uh, add-ons of petals or th that are supposed to enhance the experience. And there was in, in Yokohama a sex drug store, and I was on a trip through <coughs> Japan to write a travel piece, and, and many of my friends gave me orders for that. <laughs> And so I took a car and a driver and went to Yokohama and found them. Are you actually trying to tell us, Mimi, that you were buying it for a friend? Many friends. <laughs> <laughs> and did you tell your parents about those uh, pieces that you wrote? My parents? I was so grown up by that time. Yeah, I'm sure they read the articles. And that one happens to be in a very valuable copy of, I don't remember if it was Eros or Avant, I see my son out there. Is it Eros or Avant Garde? I thought I saw my son. I'm here, but I don't know. Oh. Uh, Mark says he doesn't know. Mark, you don't I, keep track of your mom's he has a writings copy. about condoms? That's Come on. <laughs> it was this a, isn't your it, favorite topic? <laughs> it's a very valuable one because it featured a series of photographs of Marilyn Monroe by Bert Stern. And it's become a collector's item. And the last time I saw it at an antique book auction, it was $350. And that was about 12 years ago. So I don't know if the value has gone up or down, but it just happened. That's where. And the interesting thing about it, there's a photograph of me in front of a Tory gate. And that's the only part of the article that wasn't honest. You know, they say pictures prove things. I didn't have a picture of myself in Japan or in the sex drug store, and Ralph Ginsberg, the editor, took me out to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in the <laughs> Japanese garden and, and photographed me in front of a Tory gate to prove I had been in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone notice? Nobody noticed it was Brooklyn Botanical right. Garden. Nobody even thought of that. Well, I, I guess I've been to Japan, too, then. <laughs> <laughs> you ready to turn to the phones, Mimi? Yes, I am. All right, we're going to dispense some advice and some wisdom. We have on the line now Sharon and Ed in Bend, Oregon. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hey, Sharon. You're on with Mimi. How's it going? It's a great day. Good, good. What, what can we do for you? Well, we have a question that probably only Mimi can answer for us. Um, we're planning a trip to New York in December and researching restaurants. And our question is, why is there a dress code requirement for men to wear jackets? What's the reasoning behind that? And why are there no requirements for women? Well, I think the second part of that, I think women usually know what a place is about and they want to look lovely. And if they're going to an expensive restaurant, they can be counted on to wear something that would fit the mood of the place they're going. Um, jackets, I think, are required to indicate a certain level of formality. They want you to think this is not your usual kind of place. Fewer and fewer places are demanding jackets. And while they also used to demand ties, that's almost a thing of a past. I can't think of a single restaurant in New York that demands a tie, but there are still quite a few that demand jackets. The feeling is if you don't have a dress code, people come in any slobbish way that they want to. And a man has a right, or a woman has a right, to establish a tone for his or her restaurant that he would like to have. It indicates a certain attitude toward the food. It tells you that this is a little special. And if you don't have a dress code, as I say, people these days would come in tank tops and short jeans, which in many restaurants is all right. But I think in New York is probably not at La Grenouille or um, uh, Bernardin or Majorelle or 21. And the practice used to be, and probably still is, if you don't have a jacket, they will give you one. 
And a lot of men hate that. They hate to be given a jacket. So <laughs> if you don't want to wear a jacket, then it might indicate you really don't want a restaurant of that pretension. Now, am I right, Sharon? You guys are, the restaurant you want to go to is Le Bernardin. Is that right? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So I, I went ahead and looked up their dress code, and it says jackets are required for gentlemen in the main dining room during both lunch and dinner. Ties are optional. In the lounge, jackets are recommended but not required. That seems obnoxious to me, like recommended but not required. Like That reminds me, I once got invited to a wedding, and the, the invitation said, black tie preferred. <laughs> I was like, what? you're telling me I don't wear a tux now, I'm a jerk? Is that what you're telling me? What about a shirt? Do they require a jacket? Do they also require a shirt? Well, there's only one way to find out, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard them. I will tell you this, a very good friend of mine was the wonderful fashion designer, Jeffrey Bean, and he hated to be told what to wear. He said, I, I know how to dress and, and I know what to wear. And he had very expensive blazers knitted for him in Italy. They were about $1,500 each, navy blue knitted blazers and two restaurants at that time, Windows on the World and La Granui wouldn't let him in because they said those were sweaters <laughs> and not jackets. And up when he was at Windows on the World, he was with a woman who was wearing a cloth blazer. So he said to her, let's change. <laughs> and they changed jackets and they let him in and they let her in in the sweater. So, and there was a time, um, when there were codes for women, and even in the 60s, they didn't allow, many restaurants didn't allow women in wearing pants, slacks, pants. But so, so Mimi, I, I think the part of Sharon's question here is just about dress codes in general, but, but how do you feel about the idea of different dress codes for men and women, or a dress code for men and none for women? I know you said that women can be counted on usually, but I mean, then why not just have the rule? Do you feel like there, it should be the same for both? Well, it's hard to have a rule for women. What would you say? A woman doesn't have to wear a jacket. It's, a jacket is considered part of man's attire because of suits. So you would, it would be very nebulous to say what? That, you know, you, you can't come in in a bikini? <laughs> I, I think, would right. they let a woman in in a bathing suit? Uh, you know. So, Sharon, do you is the fact that the, these fancy restaurants have dress codes a turnoff to you and your husband? Do you want to go there less as a result or more? Probably a turnoff no, to her husband. <laughs> <laughs> we we want to follow the dress code, of course, because <laughs> but it just seems kind of odd that you know a woman could probably have a low cut dress and her chest hanging out and not have to wear a jacket and it okay or um you know i is your husband a snappy dresser <laughs> not exactly no <laughs> <laughs> it says here you're a woodland fireman is that correct yeah a forester and a firefighter yeah and uh you do know, you we live in a town that's pretty casual and so do you uh, own a jacket, jacket isn't, isn't really part of my attire so it it almost becomes, you know, a, a barrier to go to some restaurants if you have to then make a, a hundred plus dollar purchase just to be able to walk in the door. Well, would you mind if they gave you one of their jackets when you entered? Would you feel silly? <laughs> no, that would be fine. <laughs> well, then maybe, uh, do you have a reservation at Bernadin? Not yet, no. Well, maybe ask them about that. There you go. You save yourself a hundred bucks, Ed. <laughs> just, just say, oh, you know, I left my jacket at the hotel. Can I borrow one? Uh, is there any <laughs> restaurant where you, you're, you're in Oregon? What part? Are you uh, in Portland? Ben is there any uh, restaurant ben. in Portland or elsewhere in Oregon that requires a jacket? Well, none that we've been to. It's kind of funny, you know, when we, we were recently married and we went out to, to dinner as a group with and nobody had on a tie or anything like that. Uh, I actually had jeans and just a button-up shirt. And the, the hostess remarked multiple times how much we were overdressed for <laughs> a restaurant in town. And so that's, 
<laughs> we're trying to square up the disparity between you know right. a nice restaurant in in Bend, Oregon that uh, makes a remark if you have a button-up shirt versus uh, a place that requires a jacket. All right. Well, Sharon and Ed in Bend, Oregon, I recommend that you conveniently forget your non-existent jacket and borrow theirs. <laughs> That's a great advice. Thanks for your call. Take care. Enjoy it anyway. Enjoy your trip to New York. All right. Thanks for your call. You know, it's funny, Mimi, this, this call reminds me of a story. I was, uh, years ago, I was traveling in Italy. It was the summertime. We went to the Vatican to see St. Peter's Cathedral, where, like, that's the church, when they say, like, the Pope gave Mass at the Vatican. As you know, like, that's the church. And it was hot. It was, like, 90 degrees, and I was wearing shorts, like an American does when it's 90 degrees. And I got to the door of the cathedral, and they wouldn't let me in because yeah. I was wearing shorts. And I was incensed. And I ended up going towards, um, uh, what do you call the, the <laughs> I sound like such an idiot, the, the place where Michelangelo painted the Sistine ceiling? Sistine Chapel. Sistine Chapel, yes, thank you. <laughs> that place, it's not a restaurant. This is why I keep me, this, yeah. <laughs> this is why I keep Mimi nearby, because she remembers all the things that I forget. So I was going to the Sistine Chapel, and I found that there's a suggestion box. The Catholic Church has a suggestion box, which already seemed comical to me. So I, you know, in my youth and hubris, I decided to put in a note in the suggestion box. I said, I thought God was supposed to love everybody. <laughs> if so, why can't I get into your holiest church based on what I'm wearing? You know, if if St. Peter has a dress code at the gates of heaven, I'd like to be notified in advance. No, and you I, have to be covered up. I mean, well, they stop women. I, I, I put, so I put the suggestion in the box, and I went back out to the outdoor piazza, and a bird took a shit on me. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> Straight from St. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> they used to, and I think now, I don't know if they still do, women had to have their heads covered because that was a sign of respect. And women in shorts were not let in. And, and I think that's a religious thing of decency. And if you don't like it, you don't go there, but you don't fight it. I, I think in a religious situation like that in a church if you don't want to wear what they want you to wear don't go yeah in my older it's a kind of right, respect some in the back yeah in my, in my uh, older calmer age I, I can see that point you know i like i guess i have mixed feelings it's like if it's if it's a place that's not just a religious like if it's sunday mass and uh, you know then i can understand a dress code but like during the week if it's just the doors are open and it's like like what if, what if it was a homeless person who was coming in to pray and they didn't have any other, and their clothes They'd were all torn? They'd probably take that person over to the side and, and do something kind. But uh, it's always a church. You may not think it's a church because it's not mass, but St. Peter's is pretty much of a church all the time, <laughs> I would say. All right, fair enough. Do you feel like the fact that there are so many fewer restaurants that have dress codes now, like that restaurants in general are less fancy, is that has something been lost or is it better that it's more casual? I think something's been lost in certain instances. If I go in in a pleasant, nice sort of outfit for a special occasion and I'm seated next to someone in a tank top or a short sleeve shirt, it feels kind of clammy. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a very casual restaurant, and more and more are very casual, and you know, you can spend $350 sitting at a counter now at, at some restaurant, so then you don't expect it to be formal, nor would I be dressed formally. Right. So, um, but right. dressing up indicates a certain respect for the situation. It's not only an arbitrary requirement, but you're going someplace special and it's a good idea to look a little special, I think. Fair enough. Now it's time for our rapid fire segment, Mimi, which, now it's time for our rapid fire segment in which I read Mimi headlines from the world of food and she shares her hot takes. This is the flash fry. <laughs> Insert sound effect there. <clears throat> Here we go, Mimi, you ready? I'm ready. First headline, unfiltered fervor, the rush to get off the water grid. Startups in Oregon, Maine, and beyond are selling raw water. Water that's unfiltered, untreated, and unsterilized. Some of these companies now have millions of dollars in investment backing. 
The water consciousness movement, as it's called, claims that common methods of water treatment remove healthy bacteria. Is that real or did you make it up? That, not only was that real, that was in the New York Times. I, ha I must have missed that. Yeah. It sounds absurd. It sounds like you could get a lot of things in that water that you don't really want. Yeah. So. I don't think that's very. Is it bottled? Yeah, they yeah they, they they bottle it. They ship it all over the country, and these like you know these health craze stores. These they sell it for exorbitant amounts of money to to rich people. Has anyone rich ever idiots. taken it out and had it analyzed? Or well, one guy is like, lead? you know, your water is supposed to eventually turn green. If it doesn't turn green, then it's dead water. You should be drinking water that eventually goes bad. And so do you. <laughs> exactly. You too turn green. Has this always been the way, like, have there always been sort of snake oil salesmen in the, and women in the world of food who are selling health products like this, or is this especially true in today's day No, and age? there have always been crazy fads, crazy diets, crazy messianic kind of almost religious movements uh, as far back as I can remember, and I'm sure in ancient times there were crazy superstitions and ideas of absurd things you should eat. I mean, the health guru, when I was sort of growing up and becoming aware of things, was named Adele Davis. And she had all kinds of brewer's yeast, and you made a, a potion called tiger's milk. Some people drank so much carrot juice that the whites of their eyes turned orange. Um, people who ate all the blackstrap molasses that she wanted you to eat got terrible cavities under the gum lines of their teeth because the molasses stuck, and uh, everyone followed her, and everything did what, everyone did what she said, and she died of cancer. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, was, I shouldn't laugh, but like, know, laughing, but con considering they, that setup, that feels like a funny punchline. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there uh, have always been, you know, you eat so much, and it's obviously something you take into your body, so it's logical that people begin to think, what can you add to this fuel? What would make it more powerful or more beneficial? Right. Next headline, Kate Middleton starting a women's drinking club in college proves she's the most down-to-earth royal. According to a 2007 report by The Guardian, which was recently resurfaced by Elle magazine, while she was a student at St. Andrews, Kate Middleton co-founded a girls' drinking society because she was, quote, annoyed that the old ones excluded women. Well, that's, I guess, another uh, woman's rights. Uh, fa women can do what men can do. I was not aware of it. I don't know what a drinking society is. But uh, were they drinking the same thing as the men? Or did they have different, kind of, did they drink pink ladies? Or did they? I think it was essentially just a social club. But they yeah. were feeling like the men were basically calling themselves a society so that they could drink by themselves. And she was like, screw you, I can do that too. And the men didn't let women in, and the women didn't let men in. Right. No fun. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. McDonald's tests four international menu items in U.S. restaurants. They have different menu items around the world in different McDonald's. Now, the ones they're bringing to the U.S. seem kind of boring, so forget those. But I found three other dishes that are on menus in other countries in McDonald's, and I want to run these three by you, and you tell me which one you would most like to try. Let me guess which country each is in. Okay, Can you right. do that? Sure, let's do it. Do the item. Oh, you want to do the item? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I like this. All right. Throwing me a curve. Keeping me on my toes here, Mimi. All right. The first food, McVegan burger. I don't know. Scandinavia? Oh, she's good. Finland. It's Finland. Wow. It, it was also That's tested luck. in Sweden, so I will give you full credit for that answer. <laughs> Next one, caramel-filled pancakes. Japan? Uruguay. Uruguay. I don't okay. know about Uruguay. Okay. I would never guess Uruguay. <laughs> Next, last one. Pumpkin and chocolate sauce french fries. <laughs> Who has that kind of sweet tooth? Not Germany. Not Japan. Yeah? Japan. Yes. Very good. Wow, you did very well, The Mimi. Japanese love... Rich pastries. I, c I can remember 
Uh, I was at, in Japan in 1960, and then I went back around 1986, <clears throat> and the enormous difference was the proliferation of French patisseries all over the place. I mean, the, the Japanese could not get enough eclairs and milfoy and so on, so I know that there was that kind of sweet tooth. And now they have pumpkin and chocolate sauce french fries. Awful, so. awful, <laughs> awful. <laughs> Goodbye sushi. <laughs> All right, well, that was the flash fry. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, that wasn't too bad. We've given up feigning enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time now for another call. We have Maria on the line. Maria, you're on with Mimi Sheridan. Hi, Hi, Maria. How, what's your problem? Um, so, so I am getting married in January, and it's a very small ceremony. Um, it's in a remote location in New Zealand. In where? New only... Zealand? Yes. That is remote, yes. Not if you're in New Zealand. No. no. Who's in New Zealand? Well, it's on a, it's on a private hunting um, property. Yeah. So, so that's um, it's not open to Even anybody else. Yeah. But the only people at the wedding are going to be the efficient, efficient and um, my future in-laws. And my question is, how do I keep such an intimate ceremony from getting awkward? Like, there's no aisle to walk down. There's no music. There's probably no way for him not to see me beforehand. So, we are, so are, are, are why you, are you, you doing it that way? <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem to like it. So why are you? No. Um, because I, I, I didn't want to have a big wedding. We wanted to elope and his family's there and I've never met them. So we thought it'd be a good thing to do. And then we could just take our honeymoon from there. And I didn't think about it being awkward until we started getting closer to it. I, I understand a small wedding, but you're talking about a wedding without anyone from your family. You have no, no one from your side there at all. Right, right. It's just four members of his family. Is that because it's so far away that your family can't go there? Uh, yes, and we have, we have kids, so they're watching the kids for us. So wait, do your, does your family know that this is happening? Yes. <laughs> What's that? Yes. Okay, so, so, you're, so are you eloping or not eloping? Is this eloping, Mimi? What's eloping? <laughs> well, I thought when we spoke about this first that it was a question of, is it an elopement and how do you elope? I've eloped twice, so I know quite a bit about it. <laughs> but you don't have your family and you don't have anybody going with you. Um, and I looked in the dictionary today just to see what it said, the Oxford Dictionary. It said, run away secretly to get married, especially minus parental consent. <laughs> so this is going to be half parental consent. Well, it's, it's not like she has all parental consent. It's just that half of the parentals aren't going to be there. Well, so it's... Just a small wedding, I guess. I mean, are, are you... What, what do you mean about walking down an aisle? Is it in a church? No, it's outside. I just don't know. Like, do we just walk up together? I don't know. I guess here in America, it's supposed to be special, like the first look and all that stuff. And Do you I, like that like, idea? Do you like that idea of not seeing the person on the day until and walking down the aisle? You like that? I don't, I don't care either way, I think, maybe. I mean, are you sure I you want to marry this person if you, <laughs> if you have to get married in New Zealand? No, it just, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have to have a different kind of wedding out in the garden. That sounds very nice, and I assume you'll all go someplace and eat... Um, Whatever they eat, in New and they have very good lamb in New so Zealand. So, Mimi, so. Do, were, were the when you got when you eloped, were the which time? 
Well, we'll get into that in a second. Well, I want to okay. get into detail in a second, but just give me a, a off the top, like, were the ceremonies themselves especially meaningful to you? No, I mean, they were uh, functional. Right. Especially so, 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 the first one, because nobody we knew was there. They, for witnesses, the judge in the court, it was in Greenwich, Connecticut, just got two of his assistants to be witnesses. I was 19, my, I was without parental consent, and just got on a train and went up to Greenwich, Connecticut, which was known as a Gretna Green. Gretna Green, apparently in England or Scotland or wherever it was, was known as a place where you could get married without a license and very young. And so any place that allowed that, such as Greenwich, Connecticut, and I think there's something called a Gretna Green in Maryland where the requirements are very low. And um, so that was just in a, in a courtroom with a judge who got two people for. The second time, when I was much older, um, we were out in the Hamptons and had a very good friends, a couple who lived out there too, and we asked them to come and be witnesses. But our parents didn't know, nobody knew, and at that age, nobody needed parental consent. But it was, you know, sort of you call your mother afterward and say, guess what? And my mother could always guess what. <laughs> <laughs> Especially after the first one. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I think she was relieved. She didn't have to pay for a big wedding. You know? right. <laughs> I just never liked the trappings of a big wedding and the preparations and getting cold feet and nervous. So we just went out very functionally, did the legal thing. And you were happy with that? Very happy. So I think that's your answer, Maria, is that the wedding ceremony itself doesn't have to be so meaningful. It could just be functional. Okay, that'll make the groom really happy because that's <laughs> he's like, it's just, a, it's just a piece of paper. So... Right. I'm the only but one. But what a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your life and your possessions and everything else take on new meaning. But no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Maria, best of luck in getting married okay, in New Zealand. You. Take care. <laughs> so, Mimi, why did you elope the first time? because I wanted to. I wanted to do something meaningful and lasting all on my own and not tell my parents. And I eloped to Greenwich, Connecticut because at that time the age of consent in New York was 21 and I was 19 and the age of consent in Greenwich, Connecticut was 18. So that I wanted to do something that would shock everybody and that I could do something permanent about my future all on my own. I suppose uh, if I had been a little older when the war broke out, I might have enlisted, but I wasn't. So the next best thing to going to war was getting married. <laughs> <laughs> And do you, did you feel that, uh, that making that decision uh, accomplished what you wanted it to accomplish? Did it prove to yourself what you wanted to prove to yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. I stunned everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did it change the way you thought about yourself? Yes. It meant I had control of my life uh, with nobody else, uh, except, of course, you had to have a groom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, I could just step out at 19 and break away. I guess I very much wanted to break away from parental control. And when your son started wanting to break away from parental control, how did you feel about that? Good. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened with the first marriage? Well, it lasted about nine years, and then we had different goals in life. He wanted one thing, I wanted another. The romance wore thin, so we got divorced. And then a few years later, I eloped again with a much more wonderful man. He was about that time 37, I was 29. We didn't feel what we did was any of our parents' business. We already had a house together for the summer in Watermill. Uh, we had a license, and so we went over to Sag Harbor and found a justice of the peace, but we did ask this 
these good friends, a couple who lived in Hampton Bays, to come and be the witness. And I ordered a little food from a few places around that, and then we went back. And so the elopement was more eloping from my parents because there were two friends who knew about it. But we then went back Monday morning to each of our jobs and surprised everybody by saying, I got married over the weekend. So. When you said that you and your first husband had different goals, what do you mean? What, what were your goals and what were his goals? Oh, he, I think, would like to have lived in the suburbs and had lots and lots of children. And it was more than that. It was just, I think, uh, we both changed a lot. And what we thought we had before, we didn't have any more. And since we didn't have children and not too much was involved, we got divorced. Well, I get the impression he kind of assumed that eventually you would be content being a housewife, not working, being at home, right. raising kids. Right. How and wrong could you be? <laughs> <laughs> and so what year was it when you got divorced? The year I got divorced, 1954. So divorce was fairly uncommon around then, is that fair to say? Oh, no. Really? I mean, a lot of people got divorced. What did your, what did your mom say? Good. <laughs> <laughs> They were delighted. I wasn't happy, and they wanted me to be happy, so. And was your mom upset that you eloped either time? My mom and my dad were, only because they had always thought of giving me a big, beautiful wedding and the family and the dress. And they should have been relieved, because that would have cost them a lot of money. And they did have a party for me afterward, a catered party in the home for all the relatives and friends. But I think they were, I think they were first a little bit sad that I was so young, and they thought maybe that was too young, that I should have looked around a little more, about which they were right. Um, and um, there was just the disappointment of your daughter, who you expected to marry off and see in the whole ceremony. Um, that they missed. And your, uh, your second husband, Dick, who you were married to for 60 years, 59, 59 years? 59, yeah. You guys never, your, your respective parents never met? No, they never met because we, we had a feeling they would be uncomfortable with each other and they were both fairly old and we thought, why do this? We're grown up and it's none of their business. And so they never met. Were, were either of the sets of parents unhappy about that? I think they were, but they didn't say so. <laughs> In retrospect, I probably would have had them meet because I think each one thought we were ashamed of that one, and that was not the issue at all. So I would probably now have one disastrous meeting <laughs> where they could meet and get it over with. So this is just a quick little explaining what's going on. We're going to do another one of these rapid fire segments now. I don't think that, I'm going to introduce it the same way. One of these two is going to end up in a different episode. I'm just telling you what's going on so you don't think I've gone insane. But these will be different stories, different headlines, okay? Uh, so it's all under control here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for our rapid fire segment in which I read Mimi headlines from the world of food and she shares her hot takes. This is the Flash Fry. Here we go, Mimi. How millennials killed mayonnaise. <laughs> Sandy Hingston writes that at a recent family barbecue, she saw mustard, three ketchups, one made from bananas, seven <laughs> sorts of salsa, kimchi, wasabi, relishes of all kinds. What was missing, though, was the common foundation of all of her mom's picnic foods, mayonnaise. She, she writes, while I wasn't watching, mayo's day has come and gone. It's too basic for contemporary tastes pale and insipid and not nearly exotic enough for our era of globalization. Business Insider confirms that Mayo sales fell 7% from 2012 to 2017. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm surprised to hear it because I still like it very much. I think compared to the new, more glamorous, exotic uh, sauces, it probably pales, including by its color. I think most people think of it as something you buy in a jar made by Hellman's, which is what I do, although I have made my own for special occasions. I usually doctor it up. I think it's not glamorous enough, but 
I d I'm surprised to hear it's disappearing because so many of the elaborate burgers have mayonnaise with something in it as part of their right. part of the dressing. So um, I'm really unprepared to deal with that. I <laughs> <laughs> I love mayonnaise. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't think they're going out of business, Mimi. Yeah, don't worry. But you know, the, a, a very um, uh, popular sauce now and. And it is mayonnaise, is aioli, which is right. mayonnaise with garlic in it. Yeah, it's, uh, aioli so is just a it, fancy word for mayonnaise. So if, uh, I, you know, if it just takes another herb or another seasoning to bring mayonnaise back under another name, like, um, what did we used to call it, Thousand Islands. Right. They need something, need something newer in session. That sauce. Put some sriracha in the mayo, call right. it like Shazam sauce or something. Right, right, right. all right. Copyright. <laughs> All right, next one. Ultra rare Pappy Van Winkle family reserve bottle to go up for auction. I don't know if you're familiar with Pappy Van Winkle. No, it is a I'm bourbon not. made in Kentucky. They only make 7,000 bottles a year, which is a very small number as compared to the larger manufacturers. They're, they're, they're impossible to get your hands on. They do one batch a year. The, the, they make 15, 20, and 23 a year versions that sell for 80 to 250 dollars and then go for thousands on the secondary market this one special bottle that's many years old is expected to get twenty thousand dollars at auction for a bottle for a single bottle how much quart pints a standard uh probably yeah. a liter three quarters right. of a liter yeah um really my yeah. question to you about this is i, I want to know how you feel about what i perceive to be artificial scarcity in food, when a company intentionally makes less than they could make, and they claim it's for quality, but let's face it, they could make some more bottles, but it, cre it, it generates this huge, this huge um, aura around Pappy Van Winkle. Everyone wants it. My neighbor Vinny knows a guy. He gets Pappy Van Winkle. <laughs> it's very delicious. I've got, he's been nice enough to share it with me, but like, it has this allure because it's hard to get, and it kind of seems like BS. They could, why don't they just make more? How do you feel about it when food brands do that? I really have never thought about that, and I don't know, I guess they, the percentage of profit is so much higher on making a small amount that they, that's what they do, but I wonder if at a certain point they don't go bigger once it's all around. I, I really have no idea. When, it, when a food is very hard to get, does that make you want it more? Not me, but it may make a lot of the public more. I mean, if... A food like caviar, for example, that's not hard to get, but it's hard to pay for. <laughs> and um, I always want more of that, but that's a different kind of thing. If caviar was really cheap, do you think you would like it as much? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Next one. Cynthia Nixon's bagel order is dividing the internet. Oh, I yes. tweeted about that. I have two very oh. popular tweets on that. Oh, I it's believe building it. Up. Let me just give the background because people <laughs> listening may, at home may not know this story. For folks outside New York, former Sex and the City star Cynthia Nixon is running for governor of New York. She's up against incumbent Andrew Cuomo in the Democratic primary. As we tape this, we don't know yet who will win, but she caused a stir the other day when she went into the hallowed halls of Zabar's in Manhattan and ordered a cream cheese and lock and ordered cream cheese and locks on a cinnamon raisin bagel and capers and capers yes capers was what really ticked a lot of people off tell first us first of Mimi. all a cinnamon raisin bagel should not be allowed to be called a bagel <laughs> <laughs> That's a sweet roll that you have with coffee. It's a quasi donut, but you, you can't call it. So that in itself was, uh, but then to put very nice, I think she said lox, not salmon, which okay. is another people, another thing that uh, many people wondered, did she really mean lox? Because lox is not smoked salmon. Uh, and I think it was onion, and I think it was capers, yeah. and so on. So it was a total mess. <laughs> and uh, all of the sites have been talking about de Blasio's faux pas when he used a fork and knife to eat pizza. Right. And uh, de Bla I, Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, right. for our listeners around the country. And I can remember a time when Nelson Rockefeller was running for 
uh, governor and he was on the Lower East Side and someone gave him a blintzer and he said, this is very delicious, what do you call it? Thereby losing the Jewish vote, right? right. What do you call it? Right. Well, th there's a long history of these kinds of political food faux pas. Right. We did a whole episode of The Sporkful about it. In fact, there was an instance, what was the one that we talked about? Um, who ran against Jimmy Carter in 1976? Who was the Republican? Was it, was it Gerald Ford? Yes, okay, thank you, Gerald Ford. So Gerald Ford was in Texas a few days before the election and uh, tried to eat a tamale and he tried to eat the corn husk. He didn't know how, what a corn, tamale was. Gerald Ford was from Michigan. All right, he'd never seen a tamale in his life and he, they, he lost Texas. And Republicans <laughs> are convinced that that's why J Ford lost Texas and lost the elect election of Jimmy Carter. Um, so there's a long history of these. Cynthia Nixon, though, I mean, Melissa Clark of the New York Times tweeted, Mimi, that the cinnamon raisin bagel, sweet and savory with lox, the saltiness, the sweetness, I that it is that. an acceptable combination, that it's a great combination of flavors. What? <laughs> she's, we have an audience member who says she's biased. Why is, why is Melissa Clark biased? Oh, she's a Cynthia Nixon fan. Okay. <laughs> Adam Gopnik wrote a whole piece. I don't. I, I guess it was in the New Yorker online, saying that they're all wrong. That the real bagel should be Montreal bagels. Well, Adam Gopnik is Canadian yeah. by birth, and I tweeted that if the, there's very few things worse than a Montreal bagel, I've had them <laughs> from all the most famous places in Montreal. They're very thin rings, they are sweet instead of salt, and they're covered with so many seeds that it's like eating broken glass. <laughs> and they are absolutely terrible. I've had friends come drive right down so they would be fresh like four or five hours in the car from the two or three most famous places. I couldn't believe that they were sweet. That was the first shock. Yeah. What is the difference between lox and smoked salmon? Lox is cured but not smoked. It's more, more, much saltier, much more pickled than um, smoked salmon. Okay, which one do you prefer? Smoked salmon. Why? I like the way it tastes better. I like the firmness. I like the subtlety, the smoke imparts. And um, the lox, when you, when you eat it in certain preparations, because one of the standards is lox and eggs with onions, the lox is soaked for overnight before it's cut up and sauteed with the onion and, and the egg, because otherwise it would be so salty you couldn't eat it. So. And what's Nova? Nova Scotia is a style of smoked salmon from Nova Scotia, and it has to do with the way it is um, smoked. I believe, I'm not sure I'm correct in this because it's been a long time uh, since I wrote about it, but as I remember it, Nova Scotia salmon is smoked lying down on wooden racks, where a scotch and Irish, which are really the best, Irish is, I think, be it in the scotch, are smoked with a hook hung in the shoulder of the salmon and it hangs in the smoker. And it used to be when stores like Zabar, Russ and Daughters and so on, got the salmon in whole sides, the hole in the shoulder would show you that it was truly Scotch or Irish. I think I have it correct which is lying down and which is hanging up. But if I, do, if I have it wrong, I apologize. Uh. I, I have confidence in you. <laughs> Last question on this topic. What is the ideal temperature of the bagels, the cream cheese, and the smoked salmon for you personally? The bagel at room temperature. Not toasted, not heated, fresh, chewy, uh, and the other things just very slightly cool. But not cold. No, not, not ice cold. No. Would, you would take the smoked salmon out of the fridge, it was in the fridge, let it come to room temperature a little bit before you put it on a bagel? I think by the, t first of all, the slices are very thin. I'm assuming you're buying this slice, not buying a chunk and slicing it. Um, by the time you took it out and opened it up and spread the cheese on and made the sandwich, it would be the right time. Okay, all right. Right temperature. Let's go back to the phones. We have Jen in New Jersey on the line. Jen, you're on the phone with Mimi Sheridan. Hi, how are you? Hi, Jen. How are you? Good. Um, 
So my my question, I need to give some backstory first. So my husband has a group of friends that he's been friends with well before we ever met. And we've had them over to our house several times for barbecues in the summer. And usually it's more of, you know, it's more casual. There's a lot more drinking going on. Sometimes they'll play drinking games at the house, which is fine. Um, but two years ago, we decided to have a, a, like a, a nicer Christmas party with a sit-down dinner. And we invited this group of friends plus one of my husband's coworkers and his girlfriend. And... You know, we put a lot of effort into the dinner. We basically made a Thanksgiving dinner for everyone. And, you know, everything was going great. Everyone came over. They were eating. They were having a good time. And then once dinner was over and we were starting to clear the table, one couple got up and said, oh, we have to leave. We have to go to something else. And then after that, everyone kind of just left. And it was almost like they got kind of uncomfortable, like if there wasn't something else going on, like if they weren't going to be playing beer pong or something like that, that they didn't really know what to do. Um, so my question is really, is there a way to kind of force your friends to grow up a little, or do you just have to decide we can't do these things with this group of friends and maybe invite other people, or maybe we just need to make new friends? I don't know. <laughs> you could lock the doors. <laughs> yeah. how, might... how old are you and your husband, Jen? Um, I'm 30. We're both 30 now, but at the time we were like, you know, 28. We're all, but the whole group is in their late 20s. Have you ever been to a, a dinner party with these people where they did stay and linger and talk? No, never like a sit-down dinner. Anything we ever do with them is like casual, either you know, go out to a brewery or a bar or something like that. So this was like the first time that we had had like a sit-down adult meal. What do you suppose would happen if you said, let's have dessert in the living room? Or if you just started a discussion while you stayed seated at the table, do you think they would still get up and leave? I think maybe then they would stay. I don't know if clearing the table, maybe they thought, oh, we had dinner, now we leave. I don't, I'm not really sure what the... Was um, it late or do they get tired? Do they have a no, long way to go it for wasn't home? That late. I think I think we ate and we were done eating by like 7.30, 8 o'clock. It was not late. <laughs> Um, was it a work the, night? Was it a week night or a holiday? It, or? Was, a, it was a Saturday night. <laughs> it was a weekend. Um, and, and the other couple, the one that's not related to this group of friends, they actually stayed until like two in the morning. And we just well, you know, well, sat around and talked. And those are the kind of people you have to invite. If the other group is the group of, you know, your husband's hail, hail fellow well-met and outdoor barbecues, they may not have enough uh, intellect to... <laughs> to stay and, and start a discussion about something. Uh, so we need smarter friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. that it may, Maybe. But, I, you know, I, I think, don't you think, like, people evolve and change at different rates. And, and so, like, you, it may be that, like, you and your husband, like, are these other friends all married or are some of them still just dating? They're all in relationships. Um, one couple is married, the rest of them are dating. Um, but they're, they're, they're still like in the beer pong phase of life is what you're telling me. Well, they have other things they want to do, the ones who are dating. <laughs> they, they may have some other plans for the evening. <laughs> they, they picked up a copy of the seducer's cookbook. Especially <laughs> if they're willing to skip dessert. I can Another only think we of one thing. I've talked about this with other people, is that maybe this generation is just not really into that. No, no, no. It's not, it's oh, not... I wouldn't say generation. Yeah. I would say that group. Because you said mm -hmm. one one couple stayed till two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, but they were the ones. It was my husband's coworker and his girlfriend, so they're not. Were part you of that happy that group. they stayed till two o'clock in the morning and you had to clean up? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, clean up. I don't really mind doing that the next right. day. I'll just get everything in the kitchen just so that it's off the table. Yeah. Well, I think you need other friends. I think that's. <laughs> That's the so. only solution. <laughs> but it's also you know, like people grow apart over time. They people move on to the next phase of life at different rates. And so like, you know, you and your husband may be moving on to the next phase a little fa sooner than some of your friends. And so it doesn't mean they can't be your friends, but it's like when you guys are in the mood for beer pong, then you go hang out with your beer pong friends. When you're in the yeah. mood for a nice dinner, you know, and good conversation, then you invite your good conversation friends. Like it's okay to have different groups the friends that you have different types of hangouts with yeah 
but you can't force your friends to grow up any faster. Have you ever been, have you ever been a guest at a dinner party that was the kind you want to have? Have you ever been a guest where everybody stays and talks? Politics. Yes, like growing up, we had um, my aunt was a caterer, so she was always cooking and everything. So she would have people up at her house all the time. So I was introduced to that at a young age, and maybe that's why I like that a little bit more. Where you know she would have a whole bunch of people over, family, and some of her friends, and we would you know just after dinner, everyone would just sit around. It was like a very natural thing. It wasn't something that had to be forced. And I kind of thought that at this age, that everyone would kind of be like that, but I guess. No, Not. no, different people are different. You need new friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jen in New Jersey, thank you very much for your call. Right, thank you. Mimi, is there anything you can do to make your friends move on to the next phase of life any faster than they're moving? No. I'm, I can't think of... You just have to find other people or other combinations. It may be if you mixed some other kind of people who they didn't know so well, uh, they might be prompted to act differently. But it sounds like what she said, they're all her husband's friends who love to hang out around barbecues. Well, that kind of group may not be interested in sitting around and, and chewing the fat. So right, once they have uh, once they once these couples start having kids, then all their lives will be over, and then it'll be easier. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody will have to go home early and stop paying a sitter. Right, yeah. but but then they can all get together at two in the afternoon, not yeah. talk to each other because they're all chasing their kids around, and all go home without feeling like anyone missed anything. <laughs> that but, wasn't my experience <laughs> with children. <laughs> people stayed and stayed until sometimes. I thought, are they ever going to leave? We, <laughs> we have to clear the table and clean up. Start vacuuming so, while the guests are still there? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> no. Clear the table was the most we ever did while the guests were still there. Right. Joining us now is the world-renowned pastry chef known as Mr. Chocolate. He made desserts for presidents, kings, and celebrities at the iconic New York restaurant Le Cirque, and now has chocolate shops all over New York City. But he can also get into the kitchen and have fun with people who know nothing about pastry, as he does on his hit Netflix cooking competition show, Nailed It. Please welcome Jacques Torres. Wow. So, Jacques, thank you so much for being here, and you have been so gracious in coming that you have allowed me to do something I've always wanted to do at a live show, which is to be like Oprah style, you know? <laughs> you get a chocolate, you get a chocolate, you get a chocolate. Jacques has brought chocolates for everybody. So there's, there's trays being passed around right now. Uh, take some, there's enough for everyone. Well, whatever doesn't get eaten, we'll put in the lobby. You can grab more on your way out if there's some left. There is not one plate per person, huh? It's, yeah. You have to share that. <laughs> Jacques, what are, what are these chocolates? Tell folks what they're eating. There's uh, the, the ladybug is um, a lime uh, chocolates. We have the one with those little stripes on top. Uh, it's port, and the last one, I think, is coffee. And, uh, of course, the p I don't know why I bring the popcorn. You know, I just <laughs> love the popcorn. They're a little bit salty. They are sweet. Uh, they have a little bit of uh, the buttery. Um, a lesson about the... the the bagel earlier, and I say, oh my God, that's a sweet and salty. Am I, am I going to get in trouble with Mimi with that? <laughs> What's your take on the idea of the cinnamon raisin bagel with smoked salmon? You know, it's interesting because, and Mimi, I'm always amazed by your knowledge of food. Uh, there is sugar into the salmon. The salmon is cured with salt and sugar. So it, there is a little bit of sweetness in it. Um, what do you say to that, Mimi? Not so you notice. <laughs> I mean, I know there may be a little in for certain action in the yeast yes. or, or to balance the flavor, but you don't taste sweet. You don't. No, no, you don't. No, no, Unless you, don't. you chew right. it for a long, long time and the starch turns into sugar. That mm. used to be a test in biology class that the enzyme diastase, which is secreted by your salivary your saliva, glands, yes. turns starch to sugar so it can be digested. And we used to be given little bits of um, 
n seemingly non-sweet crackers to chew and chew in biology class until it began to taste sweet. Listen. Wow, yeah, that's, I mean, geez. <laughs> that's me, me. Yeah, that's right. You didn't, uh, you didn't know you were going to get a biology lesson here tonight. So, Mimi, you have brought some special treats from your, uh, your private stash. Well, I want to sell these to Jacques. I have about 100. <laughs> okay. so, so business, I'm, business. <laughs> so what what, what are these for people who can't see? Describe what these are. These are antique chocolate molds. I brought very small ones. These are from Holland. This is an especially interesting one. It's the letter M, and there's a complete alphabet because... On St. Nicholas Eve in Holland, children are given their initials in chocolate. And so there are a whole alphabet of molds uh, with which to make the chocolate letters called banket letters in Holland. And um, now most of them are made of plastic, which are not as good because they don't have the same definition. And I once did an exhibit for a Hallmark gallery on celebrations and all of the artifacts related to particular celebrations. And I got all of these in Holland for St. Nicholas Eve, which is December 5th. And what, and what's the, what are these other two? And, and, and the, I should describe, th these are, can I hold one please, Mimi? Th these, are, these are thick, heavy metal molds. One of them is sort of like a... Uh, he's a, um, a, a, a Hans Brinker in the Silver Skates oh, because yes, he's, he's skating. from Holland. Right. He's a skater. He's like a, like a, a and man that's St. Nicholas. And you have a St. Nicholas. You want to hold one, Jacques? These are like thick metal, very durable. What, what makes these special, Jacques? So the way to make them, to, uh, to, to mold them, is actually to pour the chocolates in here, and then you reverse them. You let the chocolate pour out, and then that action going to build about 116 to 18 thickness of chocolates in the mold. Let's it cool down and do that one more time or even two more times. So you build up the thickness of the chocolates, put them in the fridge, the chocolate going to shrink a little bit. Then you open on both sides and the mold will separate. And then the, hopefully the chocolate <laughs> will come out. So that's how it works. You know, the, the, it's interesting, but the mold... Um, the, the, the mold was developed in five, um, let's say, in five steps. The first mold used for chocolate was mold used for ice, actually. And uh, it didn't work very well. The definition was not very, very good. And then the second mold used for chocolate was mazepin mold. And same thing, they was not as well defined. Then those are the third one, the tin mold. And they work very well. And they have beautiful, beautiful little um, uh, details. Marking. And as you explained to me, and as many people will recognize, you can get one such as you described where you pour the chocolate out, and that's a shell. But sometimes you get a solid one. If yes. you didn't pour it out, it would all be solid. Leave but in like a that. very big mold, that would be Almost pounds yeah. and pounds and pounds of chocolate, and you could never break it off. Oh, so, in, so, so in these, these would be hollow molds? Can be, That'll or be can a be hollow be. chocolate mold unless you let it all in to be solid. Correct. Correct. So, so either way, th those can be either way. Why? why? Cause, you know. You, you ever see those like giant chocolate bunnies on Easter yeah. and they look so amazing or the giant chocolate turkeys on Thanksgiving, they look yeah. so amazing and so chocolatey and then you crack them up and there's, there's air, there's nothing in there. It's so disappointing. It, That's how we make money, we sell air. <laughs> <laughs> it would be 20 pounds of chocolate. And I you have to pay my rent sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the most beautiful ones are done in Germany before Easter where they do a lot of roosters and the roosters have very high feathered tails that stand up in kind of a ribbon arc. I know, never figure out how they get it out of the mold without breaking these very thin, lots and lots of them. They're extraordinary to see. Um, before I, I disagree Easter. that the most beautiful are in Germany. The most beautiful one are Jack Torres chocolates. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> Mimi, I love you, but come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, make me a rooster. <laughs> so, about the rooster, that's a very interesting discussion. You, you will never find many rooster mold, but you're going to find a lot of chicken molds. And you know why? Because in a chicken house, there is usually only one rooster. 
So it's always less rooster. No, no, this, this is a true story. <laughs> there is always a lot less rooster on the pastry presentation than the chickens. Yeah. It's, it's true. Because that's just how real life is, you that's mean? That's how real life is. That's <laughs> correct. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. That's interesting. So, so Mimi, you know, let, let's let's try to close a deal here. If you were going to sell your collection of chocolate molds to Jacques, what would be a fair price? Well, considering the number I have, I would say about ten thousand dollars. Jacques, counter. <laughs> Make me an offer. He'll have to. I come just and told see. you that I love you, Mimi. What are you doing? I already sell. Air. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't really want to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> so about the air into the rabbits. Now I have to say something about that. Yeah. Uh, you know those big rabbits. If you really put so much chocolates in it, first they will not cool down properly. Chocolates right. need to cool down. Uh, heat is coming out, and then the the chocolate detemper or, or, or become white. So so you cannot really mold something really big and just leave the chocolates inside. Now if you make a big rabbit, we have a rabbit that's almost two and a half feet tall pretty pretty big if you put all the chocolates in it that thing going to be 60 pound and who going to eat that and you really need a slash armor to to break that thing <laughs> so so it's it's almost impossible to eat so this is why when the mold become a little bit bigger we cannot just make them whole that's one of the reason all right fair enough i'll accept that okay good yeah. <laughs> but i think there should be a big sticker on them that says hollow so you don't get your hopes up you know what? So, and that, that's true. Some of our customers come and they take those rabbits or whatever holiday it is and they take it and they press on it to see what's going on. And that thing breaks. <laughs> so they put it back on the shell and they take <laughs> another one. <laughs> <laughs> and I cry. I'm behind the counter and I'm crying like, what are you doing to my chickens? <laughs> it's not so great that they touch them either. No, no, it's 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 package, you know. It's oh, I see. Under the package here, right. but they still kill it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jacques, congratulations on the success of Nailed It on Thank Netflix. You very much. It's such a good show. Thank you. And, and it kind of, I, I love that it kind of makes fun of a lot of the pretense of typical cooking competition shows. What what was your what are your feelings about cooking competition shows? What were your feelings about cooking competition shows going into Nailed It? Actually, I went into Nailed It because I didn't like the series show. I, I, um, I, I don't really like those shows where everybody is so serious and it's so much drama and people are crying. And, and it's, it's, you know what? It's cooking. At the end of the day, when I cook at home, or I rarely do pastry or chocolates at home, and I, I cook. And um, I will have a bottle of wine. I will enjoy my time. I will, you know, it's fun to cook. It has to be fun to cook. So, so I, I don't really like those competitions where, where people are crying. So when, when I heard about that, nailed it, and we're going to make fun of those shows, I, I was all for it. And I'm telling you, when we tape, uh, the, the, the host name is Nicole, Nicole Byer. She's a comedian. Yeah, she's and fantastic. She's we had, we had her on the Sporkful uh, in August, so she's, and she was a great guest. Yeah, she, she's, she's unbelievable, and she's funny. She's a, she's a comedian, and uh, she invites a lot of her friends during the show, and they are judging with me, and we have a good time for a couple of weeks. It's always some vodka on the pantry, and, you know, I mean, it's great, you know? <laughs> I hear that Nicole uh, molds some chocolate sculptures for you. Yes, I cannot define what she did, but let's say it's anatomically correct. <laughs> <laughs> let's just say, Mimi, that Nicole's chocolate sculptures would fit right into the seducer's cookbook. Where, where do you get the contestants? I don't know where they find those people, ah. <laughs> but oh my God! <laughs> and you give them a recipe and they make a mess? Uh, yes, basically. I mean, <laughs> look, we give them something almost impossible to do in the time that we give them, no. and we look at them fail, and then we make fun of them with them. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much the show. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just funny. If you see what they do, it's just funny. I mean, I, I have a lot of fun doing that. M Mimi, what are your feelings about cooking competition shows, the, the traditional ones? I'm not a big fan of the in-your-face screaming and yelling, five minutes, four minutes, get it done, get it. You know, that's showmanship. That's not about cooking. That's about tension and, and so on. The kind of cooking shows I like are where they show you how to cook something. Um, what? That's crazy! <laughs> Jacques Pepin, um, uh, I like Lydia Bastianich. 
Uh, I generally watch late on Sunday afternoon some of the cooking shows on PBS. Yes. I think Ina Garten is very good because she has a lot of charm uh, and a beautiful setting, and you really know how to do something. So I'm a little more for that than Chopped and, and those shows, the noisy ones. Right. You're right. I get chopped in chopped, so I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> but Jacques Pépin, oh my God, what a what a chef! And when he and, uh, Julia, and Julia were together, oh. that was marvelous. Of course, Julia was Julia Child. Uh, Julia yeah. Child was, you know, probably the best to learn to cook. Did something. you and her ever ever cross paths? Oh yes, oh yes. What was she we, like? She was charming and full of fun, and she loved to drink a lot of wine <laughs> and laugh a lot. And we used to, uh, I used to get out Santa Barbara way, usually about once a year, which is where she spent the winter. So we would always eat out there. And then once outside of Boston, uh, we went together to, um, I'm trying to think of his name, the seafood man, had a restaurant there. and. Um, I wanted to go because I was writing about Boston restaurants, and we made a reservation in another name, and my husband and I picked up Julia, and we went to the restaurant, and of course, when we came in, they saw it was Julia Child, and the chef kept came running out, and later he said, I said in my kitchen, you must be here because you never know when Julia Child is going to walk in with Mimi Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> He's a famous chef. I can't think of his name at the moment, but uh, wasn't there? He, he wasn't has there... the summer shack. Oh, okay. Jackson, um, uh, Jackson White. Jason White. Isn't Jasper it? White. Jasper White. Yes. That's all right. It. He had a, his first place, which had a lot of Thai food, down near the market. And right. that's where he said, you never know in Julia Child. Um, <laughs> and didn't you and Julia Child like cross paths with something like at a White House? Wasn't there a White House dinner that? Yes, it was at the Bicentennial when uh, the Fords were hosting Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. And I was- Bunch of B-listers is what you're saying, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was relatively new at the Times. And the PR people for Julia's show, because she was going to- uh, film the cooking, and then that night show the film of the cooking and film the dinner and so on, invited the Washington Post and the New York Times to send a reporter to watch Julia Child doing the fi filming and write about the event of the preparation. And my editor selected me, and she said, you know, you don't have to write about Julia Child. I said, I know that. I can write about what I see. And so it was very interesting scheduling to get it done. But when I did get there, I saw a lot of things that I would not have liked, like the lobster halves were prepared 24 hours in advance with aspic and kept in the refrigerator for 24 hours. Who wants to eat that lobster? But what I criticized most of all was that it was a French menu for an American bicentennial. And I did not think it should have been a French menu. And I wrote that. And uh, the, the story came out the day of the dinner. And that night, in commenting on the dinner, Julia Child, I guess I really annoyed the chef, Henry Haller or something. And she said, Mimi Sheridan said, we should have served American food. What did she want? Hamburgers and fried chicken. And I was. <laughs> So happy because I was new at the Times, and there was my name out on national television. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have been more pleased. Well, Jacques, as a Frenchman, how do you feel about that menu at the Bicentennial? <laughs> Look, that's what we do. We always cook for people, you know? People go to war, they do different things. The French, we cook for people. That's what we do. But these days, if there were such a dinner, it would be American food. Definitely, They would yes. have salmon I mean, from there Washington. Is and there, yeah. is, there is today some wonderful chef in the U.S. And yes, of course, of course. Yeah. But what, what would constitute to you American food? Well, lamb from Colorado, salmon from the West Coast or the East Coast. But the lobster was from Maine, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. I mean, they, they the didn't product, come from but not the preparation. The preparation might be French, you know. yes. A lot of butter. Yeah. Did Julia Child ever uh, get over your critique? Um, 
I don't think she ever really trusted me because she did not like that I did negative reviews of restaurants. She thought I should only write about places I like. And every once in a while she said, I think of a young chef being scared that Mimi Sheraton is going to come in and not like it and, you know, kill him. And uh, she never really totally trusted me, although we had a lot of good times together and drank a lot of wine. And so, <laughs> <laughs> Little did she understand that, that was your favorite part of the job. <laughs> what? Critiquing the chefs. No, the wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But my most favorite part of the job was not doing negative reviews. Right. It was finding good places and doing... Uh, it was fun to write about the negative ones because you could be pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I would rather do a good review of a good restaurant. Jacques, is there something you would like to ask Mimi? Um, we talk a little bit about the, the, what's going on in chocolate's world with those uh, beans-to-bar chocolates or farm to table now it's that exists in cooking but in chocolate it will be that uh, from from beans to bar and that's a big movement but um, not everything is good out there what what do you what is your take on that well i think it's part of an overall movement on food with coffee or chocolate or you know farm to table and which beans and which chocolate and sometimes is not as good as if you blend things from different places. But yes. there are so many ethical, moralistic issues now. I was at um, the Angelica Movie Center a while ago, and you know, they have a counter for food, and they had about six different brands of chocolate bars. Each one gave a percentage of the profits to a different charity. And I thought, how am I going to pick the chocolate bar? <laughs> By the charity or by the taste? I mean, it gets to be the point that you have a very bad guilt complex uh, about choosing the wrong one. I will say that I think some of the concerns are very important, such as what they call fair traded, meaning the workers in the country of origin get decent s salaries. Or I'm willing to pay more for a bar of chocolate uh, if workers get more than two cents a day back in wherever they are. So that aspect is good. But as you say, it's not necessarily better if all of the beans come direct to, I mean, my own feeling, for example, uh, they talk about farm to cable, uh, to uh, table. With kale, I think it ought to be farm to garbage pail. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm pretty much in the minority <laughs> on that. So not everything that comes from the farm right. <laughs> is so great. Jacques, <laughs> Jacques, why is bean to bar, why doesn't that always make better chocolate? Why is blended from all different things sometimes better? Uh, it's a little bit like a bouquet of flour. Um, if you if you have a bouquet of rose and, and you smell those roses, you're going to have one smell. That's it. That's the rose in front of you. And if the rose is not smelling that good, then that's what you have. If you have different flowers in that bouquet, uh, blending all those smells together can come to a, a beautiful scent. Um, it's the same with, with cacao beans. If you have different cacao beans from different origin, by blending them, uh, you can get some amazing flavors of course, and if you use an exceptional cacao bean from, you know, wherever it is, uh, and if you don't make any mistake during the process, um, it can be an, an outstanding chocolate. So I don't think that one is better than the other, uh, but by blending, you, you will certainly have a little bit more, um, the, the chocolate will be pretty much the same year after year, if, if it's what you want for your customer, or you can make every time a different batch if you use single origin by roasting them differently, by because the weather will be not the same every year, so the, 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 the flavor will change. Um, we also talk about something interesting. Um, there is few f different trees, category of tree, where you, that you grow cacao, and scientists came up with uh, um, an hybrid called a CCN51. Um, it takes 51 try to be able to do to do this type of trees. They need a sexier name for that tree. Uh, that's that's a crazy name. But <laughs> the, the, w what's even more crazy is that those trees will produce between six and eight 
time more cacao pod than a regular tree. Um, they, they, they are exceptional tree. They, they, they are not too tall. They don't need a, they don't need a, a shade tree. I mean, they are easy to grow. The only problem is uh, the cacao beans are not good. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and you need to put a lot of sugar in order to mask that, that flavor. Uh, but a lot of countries today are cutting a lot of trees to replace them with those trees. When we talk about the farmer, you know, the farmer are not stupid. If they can get six times, eight times more cacao pod in their land, then they're going to cut all the old tree and put those trees because they produce more. They don't make the chocolates. They, they grow the trees. So, so it's, it's, um, it's interesting that now it's more and more difficult to find good cacao beans or good DNA trees that are going to give you maybe less cacao bean but a beautiful product. If you eat, if you love to eat 70% cocoa content, 80% cocoa content chocolates, if those beans are not good, that chocolate is not edible. Uh, mm -hmm. Better the beans are, less sugar you're going to put in it, and more good flavor you're going to get from those beans. But if those beans are not of quality, you have to put a lot of sugar to mask all those bad flavors. So, you know, it's interesting. High cocoa contents, you need good cacao beans for that. Do you consider white chocolate chocolate? That's a good question. <laughs> it used to be a Lee. When I was a child, you were not allowed to call it that. And in summer, almost all you ever saw was white chocolate because they didn't know how to keep the bloom off. The dark you're right, chocolate. you're right, no bloom on white. You know what's going on is that a cacao bean contains 50% cocoa butter. When you make chocolates, you're going to use the cocoa butter and the cacao. And then you're going to put sugar in it, maybe a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of, uh, of uh, lecithin. How do we make white chocolates? By blending cocoa butter, sugar, milk powder, then a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of lecithin. So, if you think about but no but sorry but, but no cacao no cacao but cacao bean contain 50 percent of the cocoa butter so it so does come from a cacao bean so it comes from the cacao bean 50 percent of it come from the cacao bean so that's why we call it white chocolates is it really chocolates that's we, we can talk about it's it for awful. hours it always tastes to me like sweet fat it's sweet and it's milky and that's and what's going greasy. on yes and if it's no good quality if it's other fat than cocoa butter then that fat stay in your you know what's non-real chocolates non-real chocolates is replacing the cocoa butter with another fat a lot of time the fat that's been used to replace cocoa butter doesn't melt at the temperature of your body, but higher than the temperature of your body. So when you put a piece of chocolate in your mouth, it doesn't melt completely. So your test bud get coated with that fat. That's why we say this chocolate is waxy. There is no wax in chocolates, but the fat doesn't melt as well as cocoa butter, and it became waxy in your mouth. So that's certainly what you refer to when you eat a piece of chocolate, a white chocolate that doesn't contain real cocoa butter, don't eat that stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so, so Mimi, putting aside the quality of white chocolate, what Jacques is saying is that you know it has pretty much the same ingredients as rate as brown chocolate, just without the the cacao. Well, without the cacao is without the chocolate. But it comes cacao. from the cacao pod, the cacao. Well, but what's left is not really the cacao chocolate. But it's ca cacao butter, right? I don't going to argue with Mimi. Believe me. <laughs> uh uh. <laughs> so, so putting You're aside the quality, the chocolate out, as okay. far as I'm concerned. But, but so, so, so you don't think that white chocolate could be considered bad chocolate, but still chocolate? It depends on if you like it. I hate it, but a lot of people like white chocolate. I never order a dessert that says white chocolate frosting or white chocolate. I All never. Right. If I it's any chef in the audience, remember that one. No <laughs> white chocolate for Mimi. <laughs> But, I mean, many people do, but it, it has that greasy feeling and it doesn't have in it what I like about chocolate, the real chocolate yeah. flavor. You like 70%, it has a lot so of, it's you're very right. sweet. Well, Look, what's your, what's your ideal percentage for a cacao in a chocolate bar? For pleasure, I would say probably between 60 and 70%. Is there but another I, reason why you eat chocolate? Yes. Than for pleasure? Yes, what? I eat a, about a two-inch square of 85% chocolate every day because I've heard it's an antioxidant. But okay. I eat, eat it like medicine. And I'm sure to have a cup of coffee 
right beside me to right. swallow after I... I but the, the kale's supposed to be good for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, <laughs> trouble! I don't do too many things that are good for me, yeah. but I do that. It, it occurs uh. to me, Mimi. It occurs to me, Mimi, that in your fantastic book, One Thousand Foods to Eat Before You Die, which is a wide-ranging opus, you include not only foods like caviar but also a frozen Milky Way bar. Yes. Jacques, what do you think about a frozen <laughs> Milky Way bar? I agree with Mimi. If you take the frozen Milky Way bar and you eat it like you will eat a piece of corn, just the outside. <laughs> like that, you know, just the chocolate. Okay. It's hard to do if it's frozen. And You're I right. Like it you frozen. have to lick it, certainly. You know, I mean, it might work. I slice it before I freeze it so I can break off a slice. She's thought of everything, Jacques. <laughs> so you can't get behind that, the frozen Milky Way? You know what? Listen, did you ever went home at 3 o'clock in the morning and you went out, you drink a little bit, and you go home and you open your refrigerator, it's nothing in there, just milk that the date is already passed and you have nothing <laughs> else and you don't want to cook some eggs, so you open the freezer, you find that things. Maybe you eat it. You, you know, maybe, maybe that's the time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you break your tooth. Yeah. <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jacques Torres has chocolate shops all over New York. You can also order online at Mr. Chocolate. You have to chocolate. read that? <laughs> I want to make sure I don't forget anything, Jacques. Thank you. Yeah. Order online at mrchocolate.com. You can also follow him on social media everywhere, Mr. Chocolate. And he's a judge on the Netflix cooking competition show, Nailed It. Big hand for Jacques Torres. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Mimi. And a big hand for Mimi Sheridan. Thank you so much for coming out. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. all. Merci beaucoup.